Hey everyone, it's Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. Today I'm dedicating our video to a very controversial nutrition topic, artificial sweeteners. Now I get asked a lot of questions about sweeteners. Are they safe? Are they better than sugar? Are they natural or just a bunch of chemicals? I have a lot of ground to cover here, but I want to focus on some of the major reasons why people may use artificial sweeteners and what the research says about their impact on your health. Now, before we get into things, of course, my general disclaimer that all of the information in this video is for entertainment and education purposes only, and you should always speak to your healthcare provider about your unique healthcare needs. I also want to flag that I will be sharing my own personal experience with artificial sweeteners at some point, which is not in any way a reason for you to change your own personal habits. So first of all, what are artificial sweeteners? Now, when people say artificial sweeteners, they're actually talking about extremely low calorie sweeteners that are a heck of a lot sweeter per gram than your typical sugar or honey. A more accurate name would be non-nutritive sweetener or low calorie sweeteners, depending of course on which one you're referring to. But I will probably just keep saying artificial sweeteners most often in this video since that is the colloquial term. Now, artificial sweeteners have a very similar shape as sugar molecules, so when they fit on a sweetness receptor found on your taste buds of your tongue, your body detects it as having a sweet taste. Having said that, while they may taste similar, their structure is different enough that your body cannot break them down to yield energy from them. Hence why they provide zero or very few calories. Now there are currently eight non-nutritive or low calorie sweeteners that have been approved by the FDA, and these include aspartame, aka NutraSweet, or equal, a sulfame potassium, aka Sunnit or Sweet One, monk fruit extract, aka Necress or Pure Low, Neotame, aka Nutame, Saccharin, aka Sweet and Low or Sugar Twin, Stevia, aka Truvia or a Sweet Leaf, and Sucralose, aka Splenda. There are also low calorie sugar substitutes like sugar alcohols, which are either found in nature or are processed from other sugars. Generally, you can identify a sugar alcohol by looking for words that end in all, but a few common sugar alcohols that you see in things like gums, gummies, mints, and other foods include things like xylitol, erythritol, sorbitol, and maltitol. Now, people were pretty excited when artificial sweeteners started to really become popular back in the 1950s, and honestly, I don't blame them. If you had a choice to either consume a can of soda containing 150 calories, mostly from sugar, or consume a can of diet soda with artificial sweeteners containing zero calories and zero grams of sugar, it's a no-brainer which one you're gonna choose. But of course, in today's wellness-driven culture, there's definitely been a lot of necessary skepticism that this might just be too good to be true. So let's talk about some of the new emerging concerns that some experts have with artificial sweeteners. Number one, sweeteners cause cancer. So this one we can kind of wipe off the table pretty damn fast. In contrast to popular belief, it is pretty clear that artificial sweeteners do not cause cancer. Back in the 1970s, it was suggested that artificial sweeteners increased one's risk of bladder cancer. However, since then, there has been countless human studies that have found no link whatsoever. I'm not going to elaborate on this one any further because the research is pretty hard to debate. So let's move on to some more controversial and complicated subjects. Number two, artificial sweeteners may impair glucose metabolism and cause insulin resistance. So one of the biggest reasons that artificial sweeteners and sugar substitutes were actually developed in the first place was to help individuals living with diabetes. Once they discovered that these sweeteners did not have an effect on blood sugar levels the same way that sugar would, they were instantly recommended to people with diabetes so that they could still enjoy that flavor of sweetness without worrying about those spikes in their blood sugar levels. Levels. According to most research, artificial sweeteners do not raise blood sugar levels in the short term. However, other research has found that when no calorie beverages were consumed at breakfast, participants experienced a large spike in blood sugar levels after lunch. This spike in blood sugar from no calorie beverages ended up being about the same result when participants consumed real sugar beverages. It's also important to note, however, that this was a relatively small study, and we definitely need more research in this area to refute this generally agreed upon belief that these options may be better for short-term glycemic control than actual sugar. 
Having said that, there is also the emerging concern that artificial sweeteners may actually put people at risk for certain metabolic diseases. Specifically, one study by the American Diabetes Association found that the daily consumption of diet drinks increased the risk of metabolic syndrome by 36% and type 2 diabetes by 67%. While those numbers do sound really alarming, it's important to note that these results are observational. So for now, we can only establish an association, not causality. In other words, it's very likely that these individuals were drinking diet pop because they had or were at risk of metabolic syndrome or diabetes. There was also, however, a small experimental study done in 2014, which demonstrated that the intake of sucralose and saccharin, two common artificial sweeteners, did increase blood glucose concentrations. After finding that the sweeteners caused glucose intolerance in mice, they let seven healthy volunteers consume artificial sweeteners for one week. After seven days, Four of the seven individuals developed poor glycemic responses compared to the first few days after consuming these sweeteners, possibly suggesting that an individual's glycemic response may worsen after regular consumption of artificial sweeteners. Again, this isn't a great study, so please do take it with a grain of salt until we have more robust research to really back it up. Also, these findings have been refuted by a number of studies, so it is hard to fully explain the relationship if there is one. But it is believed that some artificial sweeteners may alter our gut microbiome, which I'm going to be discussing in more detail in just a minute. Bottom line, the large body of research in this area is largely observational, meaning we really don't know if the diet soda causes diabetes and other metabolic conditions or if it's simply that people who are at risk of these conditions tend to drink more diet soda and consume more other artificial sweeteners. But let's look at claim number three, artificial sweeteners make you eat more. Now with artificial sweeteners, you're getting the sweetness without the calories, making it easy for you to trim calories and potentially lose weight without losing out on the flavor that you love. In fact, research has found that artificial sweeteners may be an effective strategy for cutting back on sugar sweetened beverages. But what is the net result of that? Well, some experts are concerned that it's not that easy to trick your body. And because of that lack of nutritive value, you actually would need to eat more of the food to feel satisfied. One animal study had fruit flies fed a sugar-free diet or a diet filled with sugar for five or more days. And the flies on the sugar-free diet consumed 30% more calories than the flies fed the sugar-containing diet. Once the sweetener sucralose was removed from their diet, their calorie consumption actually normalized. This was also shown in a mice study with the same researchers where the mice were fed a sucralose diet for seven days and their food consumption increased by a whopping 50%. Now, let's reiterate that this is animal research and we don't have a lot of human studies to really back it up. But one possible explanation for why we may eat more may be that our brain is not registering the sweetness as satiating, so your brain realizes that you need to eat more. When we actually eat something sugary, it activates a food reward pathway in our brain so that we feel good and we feel satisfied. Evidence suggests that artificial sweeteners don't activate that same pathway, so we don't feel satisfied and we may even trigger cravings and the desire to eat more food. This has led researchers to believe that sweet foods may need to be coupled with calories for us to feel full and satisfied. So when we disrupt that balance between consuming sweet foods without any calories, we may be interfering with our appetite and energy regulation controls. Having said all of that, a lot of the current research on humans refutes this theory and has actually found that participants tend to report less hunger and consume fewer calories after eating artificially sweetened foods. In fact, one 2014 meta-analysis found that substituting regular calorie foods with low calorie sweetener foods yielded modest weight loss in participants. This has often been refuted by observational studies that have found a link between consuming artificially sweetened beverages and higher body weights. So for example, in the San Antonio Heart Study, participants who drank more than 21 diet drinks per week were twice as likely to become overweight or obese as people who did not drink diet soda. However, again, this research in this area is varied and the observational studies don't really tell us what comes first, the higher weight, which encourages people to maybe choose diet food or diet pop, 
or the other way around. We also know that there may be some strong psychological reasons you're drawn to eat more or more unhealthy options when you choose an artificially sweetened beverage, also known as the Diet Coke effect. You know, I'll have a supersized fry and a Diet Coke, please. Often when people have a diet product, they either consume more of the diet food than they usually would, or they eat something with higher calories to compensate for the lack of satisfaction from the diet product. One 2015 study examined the health halo effect, which refers to the act of overestimating the healthfulness of a food uh, based on a single claim like low fat or sugar free. The study found that when individuals thought a product was healthy, they actually tended to eat more exercise less, and were less likely to take care of their health. Bottom line, I don't think that artificial sweeteners should be relied upon for weight loss. And if you're consuming that much sugar that this one thing is making a significant dent in your overall caloric intake, I would way rather you find ways to just adjust your sweetness tolerance, which I'm gonna be speaking to next. Claim number four, artificial sweeteners increase your tolerance for sweetness. So there's no denying that artificial sweeteners are pretty sweet. And because of that, there is some concern that it may actually change the way we taste and perceive sweetness in food. To give you a little bit more perspective, some of these sweeteners range from about 180 to 13,000 times sweeter than actual sugar. That's a lot. The concern is that if a person routinely uses artificial sweeteners, their tolerance for sweetness may increase and they may find that over time, sweet foods just don't taste sweet enough. Fruit may not taste sweet and vegetables become completely appalling unless deep fried and tossed in a sticky sauce. They may find themselves increasing their intake of artificial sweeteners because, hey, they're calorie free or turning to more sugary foods to satisfy that sweet tooth, while being turned off completely from naturally flavorful, nourishing food. While research in this area is still lacking, there was a small survey conducted back in 2015 that found when people cut out sugar temporarily from their diet, their taste preferences changed by reducing their desire for overly sweet foods. The same could potentially be true for artificial sweeteners. Bottom line, we definitely need more research on this, but I mean, you guys tell me in the comments if this is something that you've experienced or not. I know that when I was consuming a lot of Diet Coke in my late teens, this definitely happened to me. And I am shocked at how sweet I used to like my coffee and my breakfast foods. But of course, I'm totally interested in hearing your experiences too, so absolutely leave me your thoughts. Now, claim number five, artificial sweeteners cause digestive woes. One of the common issues people have with some sugar substitutes and artificial sweeteners is that they may cause digestive issues. This is particularly true for sugar alcohols, AKA sweeteners like sorbitol, maltitol, mannitol, xylitol, lactitol, sorbitol, etc., which are really notorious for causing gas, bloating, and pretty serious diarrhea. Like in some cases, it's been described as napalm in your Why did I say it like that? Like in some cases, it's been described as napalm for your bowels. Now to give you a better idea, just check out the Amazon reviews of the sugar-free Haribo gummies, which was made with lycasin, which is a syrup made from maltitol, which is a sugar alcohol. I mean, these were literally used as pranks to keep your unsuspecting siblings locked in the bathroom as they and cried at the same time. It was pretty bad. So why do these particular sweeteners trigger these not so sexy effects? Well, sugar alcohols are a type of FODMAP, AKA short chain carbohydrates that are poorly absorbed in the small intestine. For more information on FODMAPs, you can check out my video right here. But instead of being broken down, they actually ferment in the large intestines, leading to some of those undesirable digestive woes. But what about the new popular sugar alcohol based sweetener that promotes none of these traditional unpleasant side effects? Let's talk for a hot minute about Swerve. Now Swerve is becoming known as the ultimate sugar replacement because it has zero calories, zero net carbs, and is even certified non-GMO. That's something that matters to you. Now Swerve is made from all natural ingredients and contains erythritol, oligosaccharides, and natural flavor. Erythritol is a little different from some other sugar alcohols because most of it gets absorbed into the bloodstream before it reaches the colon, which means it is less likely that you'll experience digestive issues. 
That being said, some research has found that very large doses of erythritol, around 75 grams, which is equivalent to about two thirds of a cup, so a lot, was associated with bloating and diarrhea in 60% of people. We also don't really know the impact in individuals with IBS or very sensitive guts. So again, this may be an individual thing. As for other artificial sweeteners like aspartame, saccharin, and asulfame, potassium, these are best tolerated by our digestive systems because they can easily pass through our system without many issues for most people. Natural low calorie sweeteners like stevia and monk fruit extract also don't tend to cause digestive issues. Just keep in mind that some natural sweeteners are offered in a blend with other sugar alcohols and sweeteners that may cause digestive discomfort. So always check the package just to be sure. Bottom line, most sweeteners have no known effect on bloating, gas, and diarrhea for most people. But if you are sensitive, you may want to limit their use. And claim six, artificial sweeteners mess with our gut microbiome. We now know that our microbiome is involved with everything from immunity, weight regulation, mental health, and so much more. And that it's pretty much the epicenter of our overall health. So personally, I believe in fueling it the best that we can. As previously discussed when we talked about insulin and glucose metabolism levels, there is a lot of speculation around the impact that artificial sweeteners may have on our gut microbiome. According to a 2018 mouse study, when the gut of the mouse was exposed to a relatively new sweetener, Neotame, for four weeks, the diversity of the gut microbiome declined. The same effect was found in a 2014 study where saccharin, sucralose, and aspartame altered the guts of both mice and humans while increasing the risk of glucose intolerance. In the human trial in this study, researchers found that the gut bacteria changed the participants after they consumed non-caloric artificial sweeteners. More specifically, they found that the artificial sweeteners led to the presence of enterobacteria and deltoproteobacteria, which are responsible for a variety of human diseases. While that sounds scary, research has found that different people's gut bacteria could respond differently to sweeteners, so clearly this research is still in its early stages. Bottom line, I really think that we do need more studies in this area, and I'm actually quite confident that we will see it. There is such a huge interest in the gut microbiome in general, seeing that it has such a huge role to play in so many aspects of our health. So what we do know so far is that they likely are safe, but if you are at all concerned until we do have more quality research on a larger population, this particular point right here, in my opinion, may be the most legitimate reason to cut back. But what about the so-called natural sweeteners on the market? Are they any better for us than the man-made ones because they come from nature? So I'm mainly referring to sweeteners made with things like stevia, yacon syrup, and monk fruit. Now, when it comes to these natural sweeteners and their safety and benefits, the reality is we don't have nearly as much research on these sweeteners as we do with a lot of the traditional ones. While some early evidence suggests that stevia may help to reduce blood pressure in some populations, it's often also grouped in with other artificial sweeteners when discussing a lot of the negative side effects or concerns that we've already discussed. So for example, one review found that stevia could potentially interfere with the concentration of good gut bacteria. Another study with 30 men found that participants ate more later on in the day after consuming a stevia sweetened drink compared to participants that consumed sugar sweetened beverages. The bottom line on stevia is that in moderation, it does not seem to pose any significant side effects. However, like anything in excess, it may be unsafe. So the recommendation is to not consume more than four milligrams per kilogram of body weight in one day, which would be equivalent to about nine packets per day. As for monk fruit, one study did not find any differences between those who consumed aspartame compared with monk fruit or stevia, suggesting none of the low calorie sweeteners, not the natural ones or the artificial ones, affected total energy intake, blood glucose, or insulin levels. Aside from that, since monk fruit is relatively new to the sweetener market, we just don't have that many studies examining its effects. And then finally, there's the trendy and harder to find low calorie option, yacon syrup, which while natural, has been known to cause 
gas, diarrhea, nausea, and other digestive discomfort. One study found that 10 grams of fructans per day, which is about four to five tablespoons of yacon syrup, resulted in digestive issues for participants. The reason for this is because yacon syrup contains FODMAPs called fructans. So if you're already dealing with a sensitive gut, you may want to refrain from this particular sweetener. Otherwise, I recommend sticking to a small serving of about one gram per day to see how it makes you feel. I also want to mention that the majority of Stevia products marketed as natural are actually usually blends, meaning it's not even pure Stevia. So for example, Truvia contains a blend of erythritol and Stevia leaf extract, Whole Earth contains a blend of monk fruit and Stevia, and Sugar Like contains a blend of erythritol and monk fruit. I also want to tell you quickly about my personal experience with sweeteners and how I manage my intake of sweet things now. Back when I was struggling with orthorexia and super afraid of sugar, I drank like four to six Diet Cokes a day. I also would put like three Splendas in my coffee and probably would have one or two of those. I was never really allowing myself any true real sweetness in my life, so I had to get my hit from all of these calorie-free drinks. When I started to eat a balanced diet again, including some sweets, I slowly stopped wanting that Diet Coke. Then when I got pregnant for the first time, I was completely turned off sweet things and I stopped using any sweetener in my coffee. And now if I even have a sip of Diet Coke or a little bit of Splenda or sugar in my coffee, I am so repulsed by the excess sweetness. I've also found that now fruits and vegetables taste so much more flavorful and naturally sweet to me. So I don't know if that's just me, but definitely leave me a comment below if that's happened to you when you've cut back on Diet Coke or, or added sweetener to your coffee. Bottom, bottom line here, folks, based on the current research out there, artificials are not considered dangerous to our health or necessarily to be completely feared, but they're not necessarily benign for everyone when consumed regularly or in large amounts. I also want to note that it's not necessarily recommended that pregnant women consume a large amount of these sweeteners because they can also displace a lot of really nutritious and nourishing food in the diet as well. The reality is we really just don't have enough research to understand some of the mechanisms behind artificial sweeteners, and we don't have enough long-term studies to see what their lasting impact is. What I can say is that whatever you decide to choose, try to use it in moderation. So whether that's white sugar or honey or Splenda or Stevia, whatever it is, just try to be mindful about the portion sizes in general. And if your reliance on low calorie sweeteners is causing you to increase your use of sweet things in general, that's when I would say it may be time for a switch. Having said that, if your use of low calorie sweeteners has helped you cut back on sugary foods, then I say there's no harm. This very likely may be an individual thing. We will probably be back here in like a year discussing this topic again because I think the evidence is just mounting. But until then, if you like this video, be sure to give it the thumbs up. Leave me a comment below on why you do use or do not use artificial sweeteners. Subscribe to the channel and I will see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.